says in verse 7, And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house, named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So in this story, again, he tries to give the gospel to the Jews. They don't want to hear it. So he says, okay, well, from now on, I'm just going to focus on the Gentiles in, the, in Corinth. I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. He preaches to them, and he's getting a lot of the Corinthians saved. But he's also getting a lot of persecution and heat from the Jews. So God didn't want him to move on to the next town yet because they were so receptive there in Corinth. So God's given him an assurance by saying to him, look, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you safe. Don't worry about it. Just boldly preach and let me protect you because he's saying I have much people in this city. There are a lot of people in this city, he's saying, that I know are going to get saved through your work. So don't leave. Stay here because you're going to get a lot of Corinthians saved. And that's worth it to live in the shadow of that persecution if a whole bunch of people are getting saved. I mean, the implication is that if a whole bunch of people weren't getting saved, you'd move on to somewhere where you are going to get more people saved. I mean, that's what he's teaching here, okay? Go to Acts 28. And notice, this isn't just one isolated scripture that we're looking at. You know, we're going to a lot of scriptures that are all reinforcing this principle of focusing our efforts on those who are receptive. Now, how can we apply this practically speaking? Well, first of all, when I go out soul winning, I go into it with this philosophy that we're reading right here, where I'm looking for that house that is worthy. Yeah. You know, and when he says worthy there, what does he mean? He just means somebody who wants to listen, somebody who's willing to listen, as opposed to the person that is hardened and has no interest. So when I go out soul winning, I go into it with a philosophy of finding that house that's worthy, you know, finding that person that wants to hear the gospel. That's why, you know, when I first started out soul winning, I never asked people, hey, is it, can I show you from the Bible how you can know for sure if you die today? I just go right into it. I would basically just walk up to them and say, hey, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And if they said no, I'd say, okay, well, here's how you can know. And I would just start showing them. Now, a lot of people are just too polite to where they just won't stop you even though they have zero interest, okay? So my philosophy was, well, I just want to give the gospel to everybody I can. So I'm not going to ask them whether they want to hear it because, you know, everybody needs to hear it, right? I mean, that makes sense. And I've, I've known people who do that method, and that's how I used to do it. But you know what I realized, though? I realized I was wasting a lot of time and breath and energy on people who had zero interest in the gospel when there are other people down the street who do want to hear it. So I'd rather go find those people. Now, everybody deserves a warning. Everybody deserves to hear something. So that's why I started asking them, hey, I, I, I find out they're saved, and then I would say to them, can I take five minutes and just show you from the Bible how you can be saved, how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? And if they say, no, no, no thanks, then, I, then what I would do is just leave them with one verse. Because I don't want to just leave them with nothing. So I'd usually quote one scripture to them, Something like John 3, 16, 1 John 5, 13. And then I'll say this. Now, are you, are you sure you don't have a few minutes? You know, after I've given them that verse, sometimes I'll give them another chance of just, you know, if you just got a few minutes, I can show you a little more in case that first verse got their attention. But honestly, if, they're, if they say no, no thanks, you know, I'd rather just move on anyway. I'd rather just give them that one verse because you're still planting a seed with that one verse and move on to the guy who wants to hear the gospel than to just spend, because I've spent time giving somebody the gospel and they're just kind of like looking around. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And they're zoned out and they're not even paying attention. And then you'll ask them a question, like you'll be going over it, you'll show them, hey, right here it says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So what does that verse say that you have to be saved, do to be saved? Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I mean, we've all been there. Or you say, you know, hey, well, so what do we have to do to be saved? And then they'll just say something that's not even in that verse because they're not even listening. And I just realized, you know, my time is valuable. You know, God wants to redeem the time. It's a precious gift of God to have time and energy and breath and the word to go preach. We don't want to squander it 
beating our head against the wall, especially not just arguing with people that are clearly hardened to the gospel. Arguing with Mormons, arguing with Jehovah's Witnesses that have zero interest, you know, instead of just shaking the dust off our feet and moving on to the next house, the next town.